Okay, let's have a seat, everybody. Good morning to you. I'm sorry. Good morning to you. Thank you, thank you. Lord, as we study your word, help us. We honor the word. We honor you, Lord Jesus. I come against every demonic power that would try to take the word, cause offense. I bind all spirits of religion, disobedience, arrogance, fear, and lust in Jesus' name. We release faith. We release hope. We release grace in this room. Change us forever in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Now, normally most of the messages are standalone messages. This is not the case. If you weren't here last week, we're going to build on what we talked about last week. Um, let's just start. Title. What do you do when homosexuality comes to your house? Your daughter announces she, that while in college, she decided she was gay. Your brother, after 30 years of marriage, leaves his wife and decides he's homosexual. Your own mother tells you that she's going to find a partner, and her partner is a female. What do you do with that? Happens all the time. And so let me give you some disclaimers. Four. How many? Four disclaimers. One is your pastor loves gay people. I just do. I love gay people. I didn't always used to, but I do now because the Holy Spirit's given me a love for them. How can people find Christ if we don't love them first, right, where they are? If lesbians moved in the house right beside me, I would be the first to go to their door, welcome them, take them a gift, and tell them I was their friend. I might wait a while before I told them I was a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> They'd find it out sooner or later. But I would love them so, so well that wouldn't even become an issue. I would have them to my house for lunch. I would tell them if they have any problem in the middle of the night, I am there to help them. And if anybody will defeat, will defend them and treat them well in our neighborhood, it will be old Steve-O. Because Jesus wants me to love everybody. For God so loved who? The world that he gave his only son. Now, this is not a fun message. <laughs> I don't enjoy giving these, but I got to, and it is painful un and uncomfortable. A lot of people squirmed last week, and people will probably squirm this week too. But let me tell you what, if you go to a church where people are always comfortable, it's not good. Number three. You have complete freedom to disagree with me about everything. You do. I don't want you taking your theology or your worldview from me anyway. I want you to take it from the scriptures and the Holy Ghost. Number four, if you are a follower of Christ, now don't do this if you're not. If you are a follower of Christ, hold your hand up. Okay. Okay. The problem is with the church. It's not with the culture. If you are a follower of Christ... And by the way, you don't have to be a follower of Christ to come to this church. We will love you right where you are. Matter of fact, you can believe anything you want to, and I will still love you where you are. You can believe the moon is made of green cheese. That's me in the morning before I blow dry my hair. <laughs> you can believe that you were created by turkey vulture. You can believe that if you want to. I don't, but you can believe that. And that one day, that turkey vulture will come pick you up and to her bosom and take you to her happy nest where you will dwell forever and ever. Amen. And you can get a t-shirt and get your own turkey vulture Bible, and I will still love you. Because I've, I've figured out people are going to do what they're going to do anyway. Is that right? By the way, the Egyptians, who many thought were very smart, they worshiped. Turkey vultures, see that? See a lot of the headdresses on the pharaoh's heads, golden. That's feathers from a turkey vulture. 
By the way, I have a hard time bowing down in worship, being something that, that eats dead frogs and looks like this in the morning, worse than me. But that's what they did. Now, here's the deal. My problem is not with gays on campus. My problem is not with people in Washington. My problem is with the church because the church has got this so upside down. They're listening to everybody but the authority that we have. If you're a Christian, if you're smart, I urge you to wrestle with the Scriptures. You wrestle with the Scriptures, not CNN or not what your uncle said or not what Oprah Winfrey teaches. You wrestle with the Scriptures. Now, let me give you an example where I'm coming from. Let's say you are a young Marine. Thank you for your service. And a chopper has just dropped off 20 of you before the sun arises in a remote place in Afghanistan, and you are going on a dangerous patrol. You are the staff sergeant. It is your job to take these men, maybe women, into that dangerous zone and bring them out alive and unhurt. As you descend into that deadly valley, about 6.15, you know it could be a rough day. Your patrol spreads out so you can protect each other. And vigilantly, your eyes are sweeping the horizon. You're looking along the ground. You're looking if villagers disappear because you want all of you to come home. Does that make sense? It's a very dangerous place. I myself, in this scenario, I'm a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps. And this particular deal, I'm trained to be a drone pilot. Everyone say drone pilot, which means I'm directing an expensive piece of equipment that's flying about 40,000 miles up off the ground because I am scanning the ground to protect you. That is my job as a first lieutenant. On camera this particular morning, about 6.30, I pick up a threat. And the threat looks like this. It's a Taliban force 10 times the size of your own. And I can already detect from 40,000 miles up that they have set up a deadly ambush five miles in front of you on three sides of the valley and you're going to walk right into it and you don't know it's there. And not only have they set up an ambush, their first mission is to blow you completely up, tearing off limbs, legs, blinding you because they have placed five IEDs, explosive devices, in the ground where you cannot see them. But I have seen them because I have equipment that can see them. So, as a first lieutenant, this is my options. First option, should I call you my sergeant and warn you of the dangers up ahead and say, whatever you do, go back. Stay out of that valley. Find a defensive position until we can rescue you or you all will die today. Or my other option is just to say nothing. Which is the best option? What do you think? If you were 18 and in that valley, would you want somebody to like, hey, Steve, hello. This is kind of what we're facing. Majority of young people in our culture today, I'm going to sum up some of their thoughts about this issue of gay marriage and homosexuality with three statements, three questions, three observations. One, the thought is, well, homosexuals can't really help their feelings. They were born this way. Where do they get that from? Not the scriptures. They get it from the media. They get it from the university. They get it from their public school system. They get it from sports. They get it from movies. They get it everywhere but the right place. And B, we shouldn't judge them. Hey, I get that. I don't like judging anybody. He who is without sin, throw the first stone. Well, I've had sin. I've got issues I'm still dealing with, so I can't throw stones. 
but I will speak to this. Now, this verse, say it with me, please. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save among whom I am foremost of all. If Paul is a foremost of all sinners, boy, I must be foremost, foremost, foremost. By the way, I was a sinner saved by grace. I'm no longer a sinner saved by grace. I'm a child of the living God. I'm a new creation. Someone say amen. Whenever I meet somebody, I have hope that they can become a new creation in Christ too. Now, talk about our culture. Here's a man by the name of Poot. Poot, excuse me. <laughs> Gaff. Pete. Buddha judge, because I was worried about how to say the name, okay? His name is Pete Buttigieg, and he is running for president. Uh, a veteran, Rhodes Scholar, charming, good speaker, 37 years of age. He says he's a Christian, but he believes in a new form of Christianity called progressive Christianity. There's a lot of good in the Bible. There's a lot of stuff that's not accurate. There's a lot of stuff that's not for today, and that's where Mayor Pete comes. Matter of fact, he and Vice President Pence got into a dialogue about marriage, and Buddha Judge basically said this. Well, if you, sir, believe in traditional marriage, you're kind of a social extremist. Because Mayor Pete married his husband down at the town hall in South Bend. That's Pete's husband. I'm trying to figure that out. That's Pete's husband. And he said this, quote, my marriage to my husband has made me a better man and drawn me closer to God. Now, I disagree with that, but he can believe anything he wants to. The problem is he wants to be my president. That's my problem with it. C. Well, it's okay for gays to act on their desires, and we should not try to stop them from doing this. Wait, I'm not trying to stop them from doing this. My thought is people are going to do what they're going to do anyway. Does that make sense? I can't adjust anybody's behavior Sometimes I have a hard time adjusting my behavior, okay? But my question is, please don't force me to say that your behavior is okay when your behavior is not okay. Now, you see the train on the screen? As your pastor, I'm telling you, our culture is blind the churches aren't talking about this. Pastors won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. We are facing a train coming at us at 100 miles an hour with 100 cars with a million tons of force behind it. And it's on the track. And it is coming. I told you last week that the previous week before, the House of Representatives in Washington pass something that they call the Equality Act, which sounds really good. Every Democrat said, this is great. Eight Republicans said, yes. Seven Democrats were so embarrassed that they could not vote against it or it would ruin their political career, so they went on vacation or they were sick that day. They didn't show up. We have a train coming. It will not get through the Senate, but it will come back next year and the following year and the following year. And basically, it says this, it will make a law that there can be no discrimination against homosexuality anywhere. It's coming. By the way, who you vote for really matters. The fact that last week we had an election here in Kentucky, and I'm going to guess that most of you did not even vote. And I would say a Christian has an obligation to vote biblical values in every election. Don't dare ever stay home. You find out what the issues are, and you vote, please. 
Thank you very much, Pastor. This is just an example. Running for president, my Democratic friends, 25 candidates, approximately. They're all part of this progressive train, all of them. It shows you how far our country has slipped. And I want to say, this, is, this talk today is not about politics, nothing to do with politics. It's about something called world view. Everyone say world view. In other words, who shapes the world of your children? Because in the next 5, 10 years, 20 years, is going to be vastly different in our country. And our country will not stand unless we have revival and people willing to speak up. Now, now you got two choices, basically. Two. Not three, not four. You have two choices. You will either choose to endorse the LGBT worldview or you will endorse biblical values. That's the only two options. You can't, you will not be able to straddle the fence. Our nation has got in trouble because we let 3% or 2% run the agenda and everybody else stays in that little church and they're quiet. Quiet. But the time's coming. You will have to choose. You have to decide. Now, if you work at Lexmark, and by the way, 10 years ago, my Lexmark friends that went to church here, a number of them were called on the carpet, and they had to undergo sensitivity training because they spoke up, up, up about Christian values. If you're an employee at the University of Kentucky, if you work for the Fayette County school system, I just want to tell you, you have maybe figured this out, but you've not thought it through, you have to be careful about talking about your Christian worldview at your job because you can be labeled, and I know a 16-year-old at Tate's Creek High School doesn't want to be labeled as a hater, doesn't want to be chastised by their teacher for being a bigot. They don't want to do that, but people will lose their job. If you talk a lot about your worldview at certain times, the train is a coming. Everyone turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And I'm reading out of uh, English Standard Version. I just like how it reads. Starting at verse 21. Everybody got it? For although they knew God, did they know God? Yes or no? They did not honor him or give God thanks, but they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. You'd think people would figure that out. You know, isn't that kind of simple? And men likewise gave up the natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men receiving in themselves a penalty for their error. Now, don't just think this is talking about homosexuals and gays only. The next paragraph talks about all kind of sin. Same deal, okay? Now, it's a lot of stuff. If you want to write this down, you can't. To summarize these verses, number one, God's, attributes in creation 
And his character, his, his character is clearly seen by every person on the planet, and they are without excuse. The law of God, Romans says, is written on every heart. Point two, the scripture says they knew God, but they chose to not honor him. It's a choice. Point number three, people exchanged the natural for the unnatural. And by doing that, it brought about in their persons, their body, soul, and spirit, the penalty of their error. It messes up your body. It messes up your soul. It messes up your spirit. I love all kind of folk, but the folk that probably are the most devastated are my friends in the gay community. Christians that in college got lured to this dark side. I visited them in the ridge. I visited them in the hospital. I visited them on their deathbed. And they are some of the most broken, devastated people because they've sown seed that is only hurtful and God gave them over to a depraved mind. Black is white, white is black, two and two is five. And you can't convince them. You can't argue. You can't lecture. You can't preach. I have to love them and ask the Holy Spirit to come. He's the only one that can convince them. And we'll talk about four common theories on what comes into play with people caught in the lifestyle. The first one is this. Well, they were born... This is the most common. God made me this way. It's a natural inclination I have. I've always liked little girls. I've always liked boys, whatever. Well, let me tell you where that comes from. I talked about it last week. That fact is all of us in this room, every person on the planet was born with a fallen nature. It goes way back to Adam and Eve. We all got it. How many have a fallen nature? Hold your hand up, which means I have a proclivity to selfishness, fear, lust, anger, pride, insecurity. I got it all. The only thing that saves me is I've been born again. The Spirit of God lives inside me. I try to live my life by the Scriptures and following God's Spirit. Are you with me? Instead of being a sinner who occasionally did a few things right, now I'm a saint in God's eyes and occasionally, I occasionally sin. The media lie is this. Homosexuality is inborn. They're getting it and, you know, I get it why millennials and teenagers feel this way. They're not getting it at home. They're not getting it from the church, but they're getting it everywhere. Music, TV, commercials, the university, everywhere. So they're going to believe it. It is a gift from God. God made me this way. By the way, for 30 years, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent trying to find a, quote, gay gene. They never found it. Let me tell you what's there that they can't find. It's something called generational curses. That if grandpa opened a door for a lust and didn't, and didn't re repent, son can have it. And then grandson can have it. It's called a generational curse. And it's brought on by a demonic presence. Okay? That's real. Now, number two is family issues. Uh, all of us have grown up in dysfunctional families. Matter of fact, I have one now because I'm part of it and I'm kind of dysfunctional at times, right? Family is not easy. We make mistakes. And I want you to write these things down. This would help you if, you, if I can give you time to write them down. The thing that every person on the planet wants, every single person wants this. They want to be loved. They want to be accepted. They want to be affirmed. Everybody wants that. True or false? Everybody does. But often this doesn't happen in the home. They can't get it in a loving church if they stay long enough. They can find spiritual fathers and mothers that will give that to them. But often they don't get it in the home. Why? Because dad didn't get it either. Mom didn't get it. Mom's broken, messed up. Dad is broken, messed up. And so they can't get what they don't have. So what happens, dad, maybe it's cruel. He is just mean. 
He is angry all the time. Or the opposite, he's passive. Anything goes in this house. He's just a couch potato. He is distant emotionally. He never touches. He never says thank you. He never says I love you. He never says I for please forgive me. He's just distant. He's checked out. Or simply like some of you, your dad abandoned the family when you were two. And you just missed that. By the way, dads probably stamp the home more than even mom does. Or mom was domineering. Because dad was passive, mom stepped up, and when she stepped up, she really stepped up. And she just ran everything, and she was the drill sergeant at home, or maybe mom was just busy. Hey, I get it. Single moms working two and three jobs, never around for the kids. The kids grow up with the TV. <clears throat> maybe mom is just wounded, and she's bitter. She's mean as a snake on the inside. Or maybe she's a helicopter mom. By the way, all of us and all of you do, do too much for your kids. Kids have to struggle. Let them struggle. Struggle is good for them. Because if you're not careful, you got a 40-year-old man that can't make a decision, that's irresponsible, that won't hold a job, doesn't know how to love people. Because you have been a helicopter hovering mother. Don't do the mothers are more bad than dads are. So what happens is, excuse me, just got in trouble. Scratch that from the tape. But there's no way I can get out of that, is it? I just stepped all over that one. Well, the problem is kids leave home and they're wounded, rejected, awkward, and dealing with the opposite sex in the best way is problematic. It is. They're on the best day in the best marriage. And so when this kid who has no self-esteem, he's been rejected, he's been bullied, he's been broken, and he goes to school or college and he meets somebody else that feels the very same way and they have a sexual identity issue and they bond and bad stuff happens. I get that. Rosie O'Donnell. Describes her early family as unsafe. Could you imagine that? And said, my family was just super unhealthy. Has that affected her all her life? Oh, yes. Here's another one. Olympic diving champ, great diver. Greg Luganus at the Olympics came out as gay. And he said this in his autobiography. My dad, my stepdad, systematically abused me. Intimidated and bullied me. Melissa Etheridge, lesbian rocker, been around a long time, says this. Her childhood home was deeply wounding. And she said, I've spent my entire life looking for some kind of accepting mother figure. And I ended up satisfying it in lesbian relationships. Sexual abuse. By the way, sexual abuse is real. It is insidious. It is evil. If you are trapped in a situation, talk to somebody. Don't stay trapped. A counselor, a former gay, that was a gay minister who was abused as a child, he's now straight for 30 years, and he's a pastor and a counselor, a healed man, but he says over 50% of all the male that come into him that are sexual, have sexual addictions, were all abused, over 50% as children. Now he says this kind of violation leads to two directions for people. What are they? Well, if a violated girl, after she's been abused, may come to the conclusion that men are unsafe and destructive. Don't you understand that? I would get where that would come from. So therefore, the chance of her bonding with another man is really hard because she can't trust. And often, that young girl will decide maybe it's safer to be a man than to be vulnerable where I can get abused. 
For boys, it's completely different. Can be. A boy that's been abused sexually, often he is now bound to the male or the sexual people that abused him. And he starts seeing those people as role models instead of having friends and peers that are friends. And what happens is this boy's sexual drive is awakened and his appetites grow in a bad way and it leads to a future of this kind of stuff. Four. You won't find this in tech, uh, textbooks. And by the way, churches won't talk about this, but this is huge. The influence of unclean spirits. What do you mean? These demonic presents that mess with all of us every single day. They talk to us over and over in our head. You're not this. You're not that. You can't do this. And they just talk all the time. And how do they get, gain access? And just because you're a Christian, you're not safe. They get access through disobedience to the word. If you get involved in sinful activities, you open the door to these rascals. And when they get inside, they start, Corinthians calls them strongholds. Everyone say strongholds. They build little forts in your head of how you see yourself. And they build little forts in your heart how you respond to people. And it becomes really hard. By the way, a plug for encounter. Our ministry on Monday nights helps people find the Lord so they can get these strongholds out of their life and get free. Someone say amen. amen. Jesus specifically used the title unclean spirits 21 times in the Gospels. Uh, spirits, demonic spirits 15 times and devils about 60 times. Why did Jesus call them unclean spirits? Because they dirty us from the inside. How many of you have ever felt dirty? I have. If we feel dirty from the inside, and their job, their goal is to influence and control us. I say this with me from 1 Timothy, please. In the latter days, many will depart to faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, here's, here's some of my thoughts on this whole deal. Well, how do you approach my best friend? What do I say to my daughter? What do I say to my mom after 30 years has decided she is now a lesbian? What do I do? Well, the whole issue is about desires, isn't it? Well, I was made this way. I have these feelings. I have this attraction. So what do I do? Well, here's what I would say. Should you follow every desire that comes in your heart? Would that be a yes or no? Like what? Is it good to cheat on a test because you didn't study? Would that be yes or no? I'm sorry, yes or no? It's always wrong to cheat. How about this one? Is it wrong if I have a desire to steal from work because I am behind in my bills? Would that be yes or no? I have visited many of my friends that were on the front page of the Herald Leader and went to jail because they stole from their work. How about this? If I lie because I've been caught, if the truth comes out, I will be embarrassed. So I should just lie, shouldn't I, Steve? I go, no. Because once you tell one lie, it's easier to tell the second one. And before you know it, you are a professional liar. Well, how about this? Should I be disrespectful to a teacher? Would that be yes or no? I feel sorry for teachers today. How about this? Should I talk back to a policeman that's pulled me over? Would that be smart? Would that be really dumb? By the way... If you talk back to a policeman, you may find yourself on the concrete with your shoulders in really uncomfortable ways. By the way, just think, many cops are on edge when they pull you over already because they've dealt with 10 horses' rear ends already. Excuse my horses' rear ends. 
French talk. And you start sassing them, you draw back like you're going to hit them, honey, you may end up in a, the hospital. How about this one? Should I yell at my boss because I'm angry at work? Would that be yes or no? Keep your job. Don't. Don't do that. How about if I drink alcohol every night because I'm lonely? Is that a yes or no? Well, if you want to be a drunken sot, go ahead and do it. But no, don't do that. Just because you have the desire, it's not an escape. It's not a crutch. It is a trap. How about this one? And we have great legislators all over our nation that want to make pot legal and make a lot of money on pot. I just go, this is such a great idea. We need more stoned babysitters. We need to get in Uber cars with people high as a kite. We need a surgeon about to cut me open, and he's been smoking out in this hallway before he's about to do surgery on me. So to ease my stress, should I smoke? couple of nights a week, I go, no, dude, you idiot, because you're going to be under stress all your life. Don't do it that way. How about this? Should I leave my wife of 40 years because I'm attracted to some chick at work? Should I leave my children? Answer? And you know what they always say when they come to me for counseling or they don't come to church anymore or they don't want to turn my call and I say, I'm coming to your office. They always say this, I got to live my life for myself. I go, you are so noble. <laughs> you are so selfless. Or I just got to be me. I go, that's not even a very good song. <laughs> How about this? Should I drop out of church because I'm just too tired all the time? Or that preacher said something that made me mad. I'm not coming back. Or I'm going to stop reading my Bible because I don't get anything out of it. No. How about this one? Should I secretly every night spend two hours watching porn, fill in my soul? I go, no, no. The first click gets you in trouble. How about this, Steve? Should I have, I'm attracted to this person at school and they want to have sex with me. Should I go ahead and do that? I, we've already been touching. Should we do that? I go, only if you want to stick your face in a bear trap. No. See, desire is never the issue. What is the issue? How you respond to your flesh. Because many of our desires are dark. True or false? Selfish. Destructive addicting and I do not want to ever say no to that. So my gay friends who argue I was born this way, I go, that holds no water. It has no excuse because Galatians 5 gives a list of about 40 of these dark desires and most of them I have had and they are not good for me and I know all of us have been born that way, right? We're all born with this proclivity to wickedness. Our job is to flee youthful sins. The scripture says, do not resist sins. Resist the devil and run from temptation or you will get into it. Satan wants you and I to feed our selfish flesh. Flee immorality. Everyone repeat that, please. Flee Immorality. Do you know what immorality is? We never use that term. Do you know what it is? Sexual garbage, sexual sin. And I want you to read the rest of the verse with me, please. Because every other sin that a man commits is outside of the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. What that means is if I do some kind of sexual acting out with my body, it flows to my soul, which is mind, will, and emotions, and it flows to my spirit. We're all joined together, body, soul, and spirit, and the twisting comes inside me. An addiction comes inside me that is very hard to shake. 
To my great, my gay friends, I go, now you say you're a Christian, but you're in the lifestyle. What is God's purpose for your life? Well, I don't know. Well, let me tell you what it is. To grow in Christ's likeness. Is this helping you grow in Christ's likeness? Because so Galatians says this, if you walk by the Holy Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of your wicked flesh. Romans 1.17. You know who this guy is? Martin Luther. Founded a Protestant Reformation, and it started with one verse. He's teaching in a Catholic seminary. He's a scholar. He knows the Old Testament, New Testament, inside out. He comes to this one verse. For the righteous, the just shall live by something. So what do the righteous live by? Do we live by our feelings? Well, I don't feel like going to church today. I don't feel like saying I'm sorry. I don't feel like picking up my room. So I shouldn't. How about this one? How about attractions? The righteous live by attractions? Nope. How about this one? The righteous live by circumstances? Well, it would be right in this occasion. It wasn't right before, but it would be because God wants me to be fulfilled. He wants me to be me. How about this one? It's whatever my culture says. Nope. The culture is a lie. What goes in the blank? The righteous live by faith. What does that mean? Here's the definition of faith. Faith is believing what God said. Let God be true and every other man a liar. Abraham believed God. It's reckoned to him as righteousness. Always. Now here's, here's how I work with people that are trapped. I don't do it perfectly. You may do it better than me, but I try. Here's what I do. I listen to people first. I don't judge them. I don't condemn them. I listen to them. I go, tell me. What's going on? How did you get started? How you feel about this? I do not want to come across self-righteous. The sad thing is, if any Christians ever talk about it, it's always self-righteous. It's judgmental. It is full of hate. Because you're afraid. You don't know how to talk about them. Now, here's what I've, write this in the margin somewhere. I have found gentleness is always the first approach because Jesus was very gentle with the woman trapped in sin. And why do I need to be gentle? Because they're already damaged. They're fragile. Do you remember when you were fragile? If somebody came at you with a crowbar, you were just shattered. And so they come one time to a Christian for help, and then you beat them up? <laughs> you did not honor God. So here's what I do. I ask questions. I don't lecture. I ask the Holy Spirit to give me questions to ask. And I have, here's something that's helped me. All broken people have already been through rejection. So for them to come to us and we pile on top of that, that doesn't help them. Are you with me? That's why this is the most loving church I've ever been a part of because we take people right where they are and we love them and we help them. Because if God can change me, he can sure change you. Now here's what is, what is okay. It is okay to be angry with somebody when there's been deceit involved. Like for instance, here's a wife of 30 years and she's talking to her husband, and she just found out her husband has been having sex with men for 10 years secretly. And she says, you know what? I'm mad, and I have a right to be mad because you have been deceitful. You have lied. You have broken your vows. You have been a stumbling block to our children because you have been the role model, and you have been sleeping with promiscuous men and then coming to my bed and endangering my life. I'm not taking it. I'm not standing for this. Because you have been a deceiver. 
Here's another occasion. Mother to her daughter has been in college. Okay, honey, I just found out the truth that the roommate you have had this last year is much more than a roommate. And you purposely lied to us because you know Dad and I do not approve of this kind of behavior, and you hid it from us. I worked two jobs to help you through school, and I laid myself out for you, and you treated me deceitfully, and I'm not taking it. But I don't want to ever be demeaning. Name-calling is out of bounds. Things like this. I heard a man say this. Well, you know what? Until you get out of that gay lifestyle, I'm going to be on your back every day of your life. That's horrible. I want to build a bridge. I don't want to burn a bridge. Or families that say this to their gay daughter. Well, you know what? Anytime we talk, it's going to be about your homosexuality. And I want you to know that. Throwing out, well, you're just abnormal. Or this is perverted. May be true, but it's not constructive. Because you know what? They already got the shame thing going. And me bringing more shame on them pushes them instead of brings them. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to always honor God's word. I will honor God's word. What he honors, I'm going to honor. And I will always say, God created man and woman to have an, an enjoyable sexual life within the sanctity of marriage. That is God's plan. Someone say amen. amen. That is always God's plan. Anything outside of God's plan will bring suffering. And homosexuality is always a sin, will always be destructive, will always be hurtful. And I'm just telling you because I love you. So I tell people when I have the talk with them, this is kind of my approach. Maybe you got a better approach. I say, you know what? Because I love you, I will not help you do wrong. And I will not tell you that what you're doing is good. And I will not tell you that you have my blessings because I'm not going to tell you that because you don't. But I will say this. I will always love you. I will say I'll always be for you. I'll always be here for you. And I will, I will always help you. Now, I mean that. But I'm not going to pay for their school. I'm not paying for their car. I'm not paying for their tuition. But I will always talk to them. I always love them. I will always pray for them. I will help them. Does that make sense? I will urge them to do the right thing. But I will not help you hurt yourself. Like, what do you mean? And I've had this discussion with a lot of people. I'm not taking you to Home Depot. I'm not taking you down to the aisle where the ladders are and buying an eight-foot aluminum ladder. I'm not putting it in my truck. I'm not buying a 20-foot rope. I'm not taking you out to the woods. I'm not showing you how to tie a knot. I'm not holding the ladder where you climb up. I'm not throwing the rope over the limb so you can hang yourself. I'm not doing that. I'm not helping you hurt yourself. If you do it, it's your deal. But I'm not helping you hurt yourself. Does that make sense? I tell you, when you are frank with people, it opens your eyes. Sexual experience is a bonding experience. It was designed by God for that way. What do you mean? Every time a sexual experience is repeated... Additional bonding happens. It always works that way because that is God's plan. That's male with female. That's why you don't have sex before marriage ever. Because once you have sex, you can't hear from God easily. It's male with male and female with female because it changes your thinking. It changes your attitude. It changes your view on life. Here's a guy I told you about earlier. Joe Dallas was sexually abused by pedophiles in his neighborhood as a little boy. It heightened his sexual drive, and he spent years being a homosexual, came to Christ, and has lived for Jesus for the last 30 years. And this book I highly recommend for any of you that have family members in this lifestyle. It will help you navigate this. 
in a gracious way. Now, if your loved one persists in choosing this lifestyle, I think you should have some kind of boundaries with them. Because if you don't set the boundaries, they will set the boundaries. And I'm not doing that. I'm not honoring what I can't honor. Like, for instance, what? They want to bring their gay lover home. They want to spend Christmas and summer vacations with us. They want me to endorse their relationship as a God-honoring marriage. I cannot do that. If my teen says to me they want to join a gay lesbian club at Tate's Creek, I can't be doing that stuff because I love them. Or when my gay brother comes home and he wants me to gather all my kids and educate the entire family at Christmas time how this is a normal thing, I can't go down that road. So I have to have boundaries. And I have to negotiate what I can do and what I can't do. And this is a sad thing. The relationship you had with your daughter or your brother will never be the same. I wish it would, but it won't be until they repent. If they repent, walk out of the lifestyle, it can be better than ever. It really can be, and that's what I'm hoping for. But it's the same thing if they're a drug addict. It's the same way if they're a thief. It will never be the same as they're living in darkness. Now, worship team, come on up, please. This is when I sit down with people sometimes at a restaurant. I have taken a napkin. I've done this with too many men who had to go hunt them down, dropped out of church, and I heard they were leaving their wife of 30 years. They've gotten, had an affair with some young girl at work or down in the street, and I've taken bunches of them to lunch and said, let me show you what's going to happen here. If you do this, you say you're a Christian, and I'll list 10 things that's going to happen to them. And about 75% of the time, I've seen them say, whoa, I can't do this. And I've seen them repent. But here's what I would do with that gay friend. If you stay in this lifestyle, you say you love Jesus, but you're going to be alienated from him every day of your life until you repent. It just will. Your relationship with him, what used to be very intimate, will be shallow all your life. And the purpose of you being alive is to have an intimate relationship. And that's going out to window. You're going to miss your calling. God has a calling on your life. And you're going to miss it. And that's going to be more tragic than you can ever believe. And here's another thing. You're going to have shame as a coat every day of your life. Because the scripture says it brings shame. And guilt. E. Instead of your life being ruled by the obedience to Christ, your life will be ruled by an addiction to lust. F, you're going to miss the joy of the family God wanted you to have, children, grandchildren. You can still turn this around, but they'll say, well, I can still have a family, what, like Elton John? I call it a make do family. You can have all the trappings, but it's not a family. I feel sorry for these boys. God meant little boys to be raised by a mother and a father. Because I don't think you can improve on God's design. You just can't do it. And last, here's the biggest one. This is the biggest one. This is scary. This is creepy. I don't understand it. All I know, it makes me afraid. I say one day you're going to stand before Jesus at the great white throne and your life will be evaluated and it's not going to be good. 
You can't afford that day. Repent. Turn around. Let me help you. By the way, that's what this church is for, to help people find freedom in Christ. Well, let's close in prayer. Please bring cards with the names of your children, grandchildren. Maybe there's a boy across the street that's in jail now. Maybe you got a nephew strung out on drugs. Put his name on a card so we can pray this week. Come to the altar and pray. Pray for people that you love. Come take the Lord's Supper. Repent of any sin before you come. There's healing for you. Lord, thank you for being so kind, for sending people to us, for being so patient to help us. We love folk, and we want to be a part of the answer and start of the problem. In Jesus' name. Come and respond to the presence of the Lord. Come on.
Send us forth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. Who the Son sets free, who is free. Yes, sir. 